from a caterpillar to a butterfly. The metamorphosis is here, it's live. Metamorphosis. Metamorphosis, word, sound, and power. Music, drumming, current affairs, everything to grow and lift up your mind. Metamorphosis. No more youths and youths for sale. We get wise and don't decide to change their style. Bobby Rock, keep your empty promises and your crooked smile. Metamorphosis, come with your thoughts, change your way of thinking. Metamorphosis, the change begins with you. You, you, you. Black men black men of Ethiopia, Timbuk, Silver, Alexandria gave the light of civilization to this world. Ethiopia shall stretch forth our hands unto God, and princes shall come out of Egypt. Guide, 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 it's the voice that sets me free. Guide, guide. Good evening, I'm on Black. Good evening. <laughs> this is Pauline from St. Mary. Calling the big up on your program. I am a disciple. I've been there since almost the inception. Guide, I, guide, I. It's the voice that sets me free. I just see what I'm doing too, because, you know, I always even watch someone that tell life is on tough, and that's a festival for later. I have to really listen to you first, you know what I mean? How am I? karibuni katika kipindi cha doc i am black kipindi cha itwa metamorphosis jifundishe elimika na mwelimike
The lines are open. The lines are open tonight. The lines are open. Four five three one four 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 eight seven six four five three one four four four. The lines are open. Quick them denounce you But I still I see I'm federal My office sign separal Mean for me it's them surround you All Ethiopia me happy there Move fast like Bobo on a Saturday Nappy head khaki suit a fi patchy leg This year a patchy ya in ban as a nati dress Charge a Take us away from Africa With the intention to steal our culture The good for the boss by and say Humble yourself, my little one. Humble yourself, my children. Humble yourself. Oh, my brother. Banana. Metamorphosis. Metamorphosis.
Greetings, greetings, greetings. Ilya, Ilya, Tinasilin, Tinasilin. Metamorphosis, Dr. Iman Black here. This is a program that ends the month and the lines are there for open. Anybody want to make an input or produce an output? 876-453-1444. That's the number. Or you can give me a text. And we have some interaction because the earth is moving in such a r- rapid and precar- precocious movements taking place, the earth is is in a is, is going beyond crisis because at the moment the youths of the world, the children of the world, have to be organizing themselves as a political force to force those who have been put in leadership to respond. And respond not just to the use but to the future of the planet. So the earth is in a more than a crisis mode. And those who have been put to lead 
have been proven to be not just leaders but bleeders they have not only been bleeding societies but they have been bleeding the planet and the planet is in a state of revolt and in that revolt water land air fire the elements that make up nature begin to work in its own rhythm which has nothing to do with man it's a response to humans the human being who thinks that it is the highest form of life on the planet is proven to be the most destructive the human being that we are told was the last element of creation as proving itself to be the most destructive and therefore has no real claim to be the most intelligent nor the most powerful but certainly the most destructive so the earth is in a balling stage and the population that is oppressed is in, in an even greater sense of oppression what is the pressure why is there so much war in the atmosphere what are these wars around what is the basic element behind these wars and these destruction destructive movements and the greed and the white collar criminals that plague the society and are never really roped in while the focus is placed on the black color criminals all heap of upside down but the metamorphosis is here to set it at a point to allow a perspective to give one a chance to think because the whole idea is to think not to become overwhelmed by the events as they unfold as i and i speak there is an attempt by the united states to create a pretext or a context in which to engage in another major war and without the war even beginning economies are feeling the effect and we're talking about struggle and what is the struggle over well the metamorphosis wants to explore within a certain dimension the whole idea of resource what is a resource what is our resource what is it what are the different types of resources within the planet what are the more basic resources what are the most important resources i want you to look and take a look into your dictionary what is the meaning of the word resource because even within the jamaican context the population has been conditioned to accept that there is always scarce resources and that these scarce resources are always being battled over and so their tribal behavior is promote is promoted but really what is a resource i'm going to say there are, we can begin by looking at it by saying in a very simple way a resource is something that is useful something that is useful obviously we're going to expand and really imply and internalize and think out carefully what are the things that are really useful but the basic to begin with we have to look at nature and so you're going to realize that, that there are some resources that are within nature which we can call natural resources and we're going to find that there are resources that are man-made so when i use these two perspectives to have a look at resources and ultimately to look at what is it that is fueling <laughs> this war in the region called the middle east what is the battle about is it a political struggle is it an ideological struggle is it democracy versus dictatorship or is it a struggle over resources what is the most important resource in your life what is the most important resource in a society so that will be part of the exploration within this metamorphosis i also want to examine a bit what i'm calling the amnesia the collective amnesia that 
black people suffering from a collective amnesia amnesia is when you lose your memory but i'm saying that i and i are suffering from a, a collective memory loss and this collective memory loss is is motivated and inspired by a certain set of stories we get as history so when we examine the what i'm calling the, the root of this collective unconscious memory loss this amnesia and i'm saying this amnesia revolves around our interpretation of a story a story in a book called the bible a story in a book called the genesis a story which suggests to i and i that the world was one once washed away and that population restarted and that for 40 days and 40 nights eight, eight people and a host of animals locked up in a boat for 40 days and 40 nights no ventilation it's a site for disease it's also a site for lack of memory because i'm suggesting that at this site people think the world and history of the world was washed away and remarkably the history of the world would, re- would start again with these eight diseased people there are many people who can quickly dismiss that story but there are too many people who think the story is a reality and many many black people cannot see themselves historically before those floods cannot explain their culture can explain their religion can explain nothing about themselves before that mythical flood so we're going to look into that as we go through the metamorphosis so it's about resources the united states war secretary has made it clear that the issue that's on the table today did not begin today the secretary has made it clear on one of his one of america's great programs on sundays called face the nation he has made it very clear that this struggle that we're seeing today from his perspective began in 1979 i am thought the struggle began in 1977 so metamorphosis will pick it up and look into the whole essence of this condition that the globe faces today the potential for war no different from when saddam hussein was in power and the conditions of war were being created metamorphosis I want to talk my, my, my guest last, in last week's program, historian Antonio Asante, a.k.a. Vava Blue. I want to thank Asante for coming through and outlining events that can be verified from what is called a historical perspective. And this is the perspective I and I must learn to observe history because the historical perspective gives us a closer feeling to what is reality there are other perspectives and i and i as black people we have been drilled into the religious perspective and oftentimes we are confused with the stories of within the religion with uh, as it relates to the history of african people all right so before even getting into that aspect now I started last program talking about something called bad mind. 
because of my guess and his direction, I had to kind of leave it, leave it alone and allow ourselves to over the things that Asante was showing us, historical history of African people and our struggles and some, su- some suggestions. So we're just outlining the pain. We're giving you some suggestions. And the notion of bad mind. This is, a, I think, is a becoming an epidemic in Jamaica within the way people express themselves. Every response from an next person is viewed as a bad-minded action. Those who are in the music entertainment can find nothing more to put in them lyrics than to speak about bad mind. So apparently before somebody even says something to you, they're bad-minded. Now, 10 years ago, this wasn't the way. This 10 years ago, this was not an expression on the way people used to think in Jamaica. But you reach a point now where, you know, we are very good at exaggerating things. So the bad mind thing get reach a, reach a crisis situation. And I hear him, even persons in the station here making reference to Portland as a bad minded factory. <laughs> no, that is, that, is, that is going too far and time to stop a little bit and check what we're saying. What is it to be bad minded? Where does this idea come from? I have to think carefully now, you know, because it's all about behavior and it's about attitude. The, con- the concept of a good mind suggests that people would have good attitudes and good disposition. All that would be good. But then, you know, if we trace the, the, the nature of behavior, to define good behavior and bad behavior. There are going to be some problems, you know, because we're going to end up seeing that some of these behavioral issues are re- relative to culture. And one behavior in one culture may not be just interpreted the same way with, within another culture. So I am saying, you know, this thing about bad mind, we need to move beyond the cliche and try to examine what really is it we're trying to get at. Why all of a sudden everybody bad minded? Now, the mind, the, the, the idea of clean thinking, of pure thinking, we have to trace this and try to find a genesis, the genesis of this thing called bad mind. Now, the, the Oriental people who are not in the Bible history, they have a construct, concept within their own culture. And they refer to certain behaviors. And they think when people exhibit certain type of behaviors, their minds are poisoned. So they think that there are certain poisons that can occupy a person's thoughts, their brain. There's a culture in the Orient that speaks about seven poisons. Within this Western tradition, the Western religion, the Christianity, tells us about seven deadly sins. Now, starting from these seven deadly sins, which I'm saying the Orient has called seven poisons, I want to trace where these sins come, how these sins emerge. And how these sins come into being. And how is it I and I claiming these sins? How do we claim these poisons? And why do we not reject these poisons? The simple way to approach this within the Christian, Christian thinking and within the Western world is to look at the characteristics that we call bad in terms of behavior. So when people in Jamaica say, for example, you're bad-minded, sometimes what they want to say is that the person is grudgeful, for example. They're grudgeful. Another person might mean say, they're not grudgeful, but they're spiteful. And so you're going to recognize, what I was saying to you now, there are, that there are certain set of characteristics that singularly represent Negative behavior. 
but it's not it by itself is not bad mind because bad mind is several type of behaviors so let us look at the seven deadly sins according to the christian teaching and these are sins that all those who are professing christianity should stay away from the orientals call them poisons the first and the most critical of the sins within the christian thinking is jealousy now jealousy as a behavior within the education system socialize us to accept jealousy as normal we are told that it is natural to be jealous particularly women so the women them out there know who think that's what i'm saying go so i don't go so remember you know you can make a link i and i is encouraged to believe through education that women are naturally jealous and i hear women say that over and over about themselves that them jealous and some of them tell us that them very jealous so if we accept jealousy as normal when we examine this psychological undertone of jealousy the underpinning psychology of jealousy is insecurity now these behaviors are connected that if you are jealous you're going to end up behaving insecure now remember now you know working from the point of view that them say jealousy is normal <laughs> and that woman embraces it as being natural so does that mean that the women are condemning themselves to a state of being insecure It doesn't mean that men are not jealous because man jealous and maybe even more more serious in a female jealousy than the female so this characteristic now called jealousy that we are socialized to accept as normal it is reinforced by religion because the religion tells you that the, the lord god of the creation is a jealous god that jehovah himself is jealous so if jehovah embraces jealousy as a characteristic then his creations those people who acknowledged to be create to be the, a, a sort of creation of jehovah jealousy will be almost innate what is the follow-up to jealousy it is a twin envy now these forces are connected these behaviors are connected is that the liar and the thief these forces tend to move in pairs so the jealous person will become envious and though the jealous person will be passive in their be act in their re reaction the envious person will not be passive the envious person will move to action the jealous person will look on you and see I want something nice and feel feel inferior because they don't have it the envious person will try and take it off of you and it's going to get worse because now there is grudgefulness there's spitefulness there's wrath there's a series of characteristics that collectively make up the bad mind but just anybody who embraces any of those individual strands you see if you're jealous you're bad-minded you see if you're envious you're bad-minded you see if you're spiteful and spiteful is a deadly sin you know the spiteful person is deadly gone beyond envy and gone beyond jealousy the spiteful person will hurt themselves so when we talk about bad mind in Jamaica and jump up everything, everybody's bad mind. Mind you who call in bad mind, you yourself is a bad minded individual. And if we move away from that bad minded thing and begin to try to correct the attitudes. And it begin by reconfiguring our thoughts. Reassessing this idea of whether jealousy is natural. Because if you are jealous, 
Not only do you feel insecure, you almost want to demand ownership. You want to become possessive because of your insecurity. And it's all kind of problems emerge in a relation. All kind of problems. And each individual will just check themselves, you know, and see what is your contribution to the demise of any relationship. What is your contribution? It can't be always the next person. What is your contribution within the bad mind construct? Were you wrathful? Were you slothful? Were you jealous? Were you envious? Were you spiteful? Were you grudgeful? If you hold those feelings, you too suffering from that illness. Metamorphosis. WhatsApp is up and running, and so the message is coming in from San Andres Island in Colombia. Hello, Dr. Ayman, listening to you from San Andres Island, Colombia. Very nice and interesting program, Herbert Mitchell. One love, yes, Herbert. Keep lo- keep it locked. Sides of him, global, and the reasoning is universal. Yeah, the WhatsApp is up and running. This person says, God is jealous. Love is not. God is love. <laughs> All right? So, God is jealous and love is not. And God is love. All right? Not much look forward to on local radio. Your time is appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. All right. God is jealous. Love is not. And God is love. All right, interesting, interesting. No, even the notion of love, you know. <laughs> hey, boy, I tell you, you know this concept of thinking in a binary, where it's either or either, is that very dangerous place to live, you know. 
So we are locked up in this binary in our thinking. So we think it's either or either. So if it's not love, is hate. And it's not up, it's down. No, the notion of, the notion of, of bad mind. Jehovah God. According to the Christian Bible and according to the scripture, according to Moses and all these characters. Say, I am a jealous God. Thou shalt have no other God but me. No, check this. This is supposed to be the first law, the first commandment to capture black people now, you know. Under the whole Jehovah administration. Right? And this is the first commandment. And check it out. It say. I am the Lord thy God Jehovah. I am a jealous God. Thou shalt have no other God but me. You know why Jehovah God said that? Because Jehovah God knows enough more gods than you know. Jehovah God know about ancient gods and goddesses of Africa and ancient Egypt. Because Jehovah God is a Moses creation. And Moses, according to the story, grew up in a polytheistic ancient Egypt. So he know about Amon Ra, he know about not him know about Jeb, him know all about the literature of ancient Africa. But to lead a political movement, him need a one God. You can't lead a political movement with many gods. You're going to have too much leaders, right? too much, too much, too much different crew. So you have to create a, 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 a tyrant. So Jehovah God established under the Moses order is a, is a jealous God. And jealousy is based upon an insecurity because there are other gods. And these other gods, of course, are ancient and more powerful and black. So when you read and you think critically about what they put on us, and you go around the corner and realize that this jealous god is jealous because there are other gods, then we begin to question who and what are these other gods? And what is the ancientcy of these other gods? Because Jehovah God just emerged within the, 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 the Hebrew Jewish tradition. So you begin to move to consciousness outside of the box. And you begin to think clearer. Now, the good mind and the bad mind. We are told that the good mind is a, is a, is a mind of God. And of course, the bad mind. It's the mind of Satan. Because I'm giving the binary. It's either or either. Of course, the good mind is white. Don't you know that? Yes, porcelain white. And the bad mind, you know, it's, it's black. And you know, you can tell the white lies and it, you get away. Because white lies are small. But you know, you tell the black lies, you know, you go to prison. So we get locked up into this way of looking at things. So the good mind now, they gave us a story that there was once a time when it was all good. Remember the story? Yeah, they tell us that there was a time when it was all good. And something happened. And something bad appeared. Now it's a story, you know, because there are no human beings there. These are brains projecting out. And they say now that this place where all goodness was was called heaven and in that place were all goodness greatness positive energies lord god the creator and his angels all good all of them possessing the good mind and then all of a sudden boop something switch and we hear through the story again that Bad mind enter one of the angels. <laughs> Bad mind just enter. So, critically examining now, what is it that could have entered this angel to make this angel now have bad mind against the, 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 his creator? And he said, according to the story, is a political thing take place, you know? Is a challenge of power. Is a challenge to power. And then, Insecurity demonstrated by Lord God who was challenged. You see, it, it's a struggle, you know. Remember, it's a, it's a literature now. It's a narrative. It has been given to us for 2,000 years. Now we are critically exploring it. 
So this notion of the mind becoming bad in that place because a war had to be fought and he ain't dead gone there and ultimately we hear that the loser was thrown out and in that toss out out came the bad mind yeah all minds that were remain remain good and the bad mind fell to earth with with its angels it's a story i and i must begin to look at these as stories literature and we have to free our own thinking from these ideas of bad mind. There was a time when there was no Jehovah to embrace. So there was a time when jealousy was not considered to be normal. And it is not normal. And I must move to the state where we become confident. Self-confidence. True self-awareness. True self-respect. These are the aspects of reconstruction will make us no longer embrace the idea of jealousy so our relations can prosper without any hide and seek and doubting because mary look at me nicely and jane feel jealous because of how mary look at me and john feel hurt because robert look at mary that way and all them type of foolish stuff look at clear for self Metamorphosis. We want the truth. 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 We Greetings, metamorphosis. Greetings, sir. Yes, sir. Like where I teach you, let me know. All right. Yeah, man, go and continue with the work. So what do you say? Earthquake. Earthquake. Yeah, man, play about the song there. All right, all right, all right.
<laughs> yeah, we got to we got to keep keep the fight constructive. There's a text that says that the fundamental principle in human behavior is good or evil. So you see now we have people thinking out, thinking out and asking these questions, you know. So here we are now with, a, with another binary. This, this listener is suggesting that the fundamental principle in, the, in human behavior is good or evil. And I'm saying it's not either, either or either that. That's saying that you're either good or evil. And I'm saying there is a not a perspective to being good or evil or evil and there's a position I, i'm going to outline as being indifferent and you can respond to that just like there are protons and neutrons and electrons there are three parts to everything and so we, we have been locked for centuries into the into the binary of the either or either so i automatically have to search for the tertiary perspective the third view so i'm saying that there's a point a position called indifference because good and evil could be considered to be relative according to where you are and your situation. Because we know, for example, that a man who is ravished and hungry and takes something off of the tree and the tree is on another man's property, you might call that man a thief. But within that man's existence is survival I'm dealing with. So what he has done within his own consciousness was a good thing get some food and you may say well then what he has done is bad because he has broken the law and he's coming to your property and take your goods and blah 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 so you see the good and evil thing i don't really i'm not an individual who exposed the idea of good overcoming evil you know i don't and i'm living in that kind of that kind of dream you know i know that his power on the earth is not good on the earth it's power it is up to the good to get power because good over evil is a nice talk. But as long as the evil remain powerful, the good do have a chance. So make a wake up out of that binary and that talk about good over evil and just keep singing and chanting good over evil. is might. What is happening is the powerful are having a good time over the powerless. Yeah? It's a powerful versus the powerless. And the powerless must arm themselves. And to arm themselves, you can't begin by taking up physical weapons and you don't know what you're shooting and who you're shooting at. The armament begins in the mentality, the psychological armament, or from another perspective, rearm, rearm our mentality to deal with this situation that faces us in this point in time. So, yeah, metamorphosis.
planning a party, club night out, stage show, a gospel concert, or even a business sales event, let Styles FM be a part of your promoting tool. Take advantage of our low price promotion packages with commercials, interviews, giveaways, reviews, and much more. We have special offers when you mix and match and bundle your options. Contact us at 876-286-9216 or 439-5160. Styles FM for the most effective way to exploit your marketing dollar. What a Wednesday it's going to be. A September to remember on the Caravan of Love show. This Wednesday, September 25th, it's history in the making. Chungy will be there. Black of Pearl, the teacher Colin Anthony, Smooth It Boss DJ Prestige, Well Easy General DJ Mookie, and many more from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. Ladies, take the day off. Call in sick. This Wednesday, it's going to be a September to remember. Architects, draftsmen, and surveyors, get your drawings printed in high-quality professional standards. We can satisfy your printing needs. Whether it is for presentation to your clients or for submitting building and subdivision application, make it VJ Printing Services. Whether drawing by hand or with computer-aided softwares, we will plot your negatives and print the copies as you need. We do high-quality white paper printing that is water-resistant and never fades, unlike traditional blueprint. For more information, call VJ Printing at A. 893-2266 Well you don't know it's Steph I Fire Show Steph I Fire wake up in the morning to the sunlight and your face lifted head to the sky breathing the air of another day another Thursday yeah yeah she give a thanks to Jah, guidance and discharge. She pray with this ritual devotion. She enhance her energy, a positivity. She open eyes and open mind and open thoughts. But they don't know it's girl birds. I representing for the Steph I Fire Show. Art. For the best quality in sound reinforcement and backlining, Native Audio. We have professional engineers with over 20 years of experience. So call us and we'll take care of your parties, wedding receptions, barbecues, conferences and small stage shows. Crystal clear sound, Native Audio. Our prices are the best. Call us at 871-5212. That's 871-5212. Native Audio. We make your events audible. 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 The views expressed on this program are not necessarily the views of Native Broadcasting Network or Styles FM.
Metamorphosis, moving into Alkibu land, our story, Kimit, KMT. This is the state of our consciousness before we were touched by the Islamic forces and later on to be overrun by the European forces. At point in our story when there were no Muslims, Afri Africans and there were no Christian Africans. So we had black people in their worshipping of the sun. And we had black people globally celebrating the, the forces of nature, respecting polytheist, polytheism as a way of observing the elements in the universe. Now, after the capture, of the invasion and the capture and the partition of Africa up to 1884. The civilizations of the great Olmecs and Toltecs and Ashanti and Zulu and Mandingo, all those civilizations were basically destroyed. And in that destruction of black civilization, the people who were the colonizers brought with them their own propaganda and their own cultural information. And after hundreds of years of this bombardment of European culture, black people generally stop calling themselves Kemetic. We no longer recognize ourselves as Kemetic. We now began to call ourselves as Africans and then we began to call ourselves Negroes and colored folks and hyphenated black people, all kind of things. Our main source of information about anything came from the Bible. It was presented to us before we got into the public school. And from that book we were told that there's history, there's maths, there's science, there's and everything we were told was in that book. We were also given a perspective of history in that book. Before we get to the basic school, we are told that the world began in the beginning and that we're told that the world ended with the flood. And then we're told that the world began again. And then we're told that the world will end again. And, the, you know, we've been given these restarts and restarts historically. It took our own black people to begin to write the records that were accurate and from the perspective of the black man's history. Writing from the perspective of being an ancient Egyptian before the invasion. So to be able to bring that consciousness to the present, not many men can do that. Well, one such man that allow I and I to know of ourselves before the Christian era was a Jamaican. And that Marcus Garvey. Because Marcus Garvey was not a historian. Marcus Garvey could be more considered to be a philosopher and a political leader and a cultural icon. But Marcus Garvey was not a historian. And like my brother was here in the last program, this person that I'm about to speak to is a historian. And it's this historian that has allowed I and I to speak so confidently and so proudly about I history. And the stories that were written by this historian have nothing to do with Bible stories. Because there is a difference between Bible story and African history. There's a clear difference between Kemetic history and the story that we read in the Bible. So this writer here now, who I speak to, is a man called J.A. Rogers. Rogers was born in 1880. So he was born in the same decade of Garvey. He was born before Marcus Garvey. He died in 1966, which means he died after Marcus Garvey. Garvey died in 1940. J.A. Rogers. Now, if you go to the University of the West Indies, I can bet you, you will not find any of this literature from this writer. And I don't, I've never come across any courses that speak to history in which Roger's books are used. I am saying it's a disgrace 
And it's a slap in the face of black man's intellect and the power of our historians. J.A. Rogers, self-trained historian, journalist, and a novelist. Joel Augustus Rogers. And what Rogers did, he spent most of his life destroying the pseudo-scientific and racist depictions of people of African ancestry in a negative way. In other words, Rogers decided to debunk all those theories that show that black people were inferior and that black people had no history and that black people's history could only be found in the Bible. Rogers was born in sep September 6th. Where? In Negril, Jamaica. Now, people in Negril and people in Westmoreland, where is the statue of J.A. Rogers? The library in Westmoreland, where is the section? Where is the statue? Where are the books? of J.A. Rogers because this virgin here this man personally helped I and I to open my inner eye and to go beyond Christianity and Islam into the blackness of, of the world and the globe and the culture of I and I so Rogers born in Negril he and his brothers and he and his siblings they they grew up with them with their mother until the mother passed away. The mother was a school teacher. Well, the father was a school teacher, Samuel John Rogers. Now Rogers emigrated to the United States in 1906. As you notice, the movement of people from Jamaica to America continues. And Rogers became a naturalized citizen in 1917. So that means that by the time that he became a naturalized citizen, Garvey was in, was, in, was in Harlem. And Rogers lived briefly in Chicago before eventually settling in New York City. Joel Rogers, he had a whole heap of different jobs, including and specifically a job on the train line. He got a job on the Pullman as a Pullman porter. He was also a teacher. But Rogers found his niche, his niche as a journalist and a historian. And he began to focus on combating what he saw as white racist propaganda history in both books and popular films and other media of the period. Those things that omitted persons of African ancestry as contributors to world history. J.A. Rogers, this is a man who sets himself on a mission. On a mission to combat white racist propaganda in the history books and in the popular films. We need more committed soldiers in this struggle. Metamorphosis. Here is a story told to the children of Africa. We love the children of Africa. Teaching the children. Oh, da, 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 da. La, da, da, da. Oi, black eye, black hair, black skin, black queen, stand majestic with the black king. Today I'll sing you a black song You need to hear about beautiful black things Cause most time we hear about black We hear about black magic and black witches Black list, black book, black market Black Friday, you spend off your black witches I've never seen a doctor in black Nor seen a black pill to cure no black people But I've seen bush doctors like Tosh and Molly Resurrect like a real black people Malcolm, Marcus, Martin When you see Walter Rodney, ask him Oh, you not hear about how we're laughing So when the little offspring asking, tell them They never told us that black 
Black is beautiful, they never told us. Black is beautiful, they never told us. That black is beautiful, they never told us. They never told us that black is beautiful. You never spend 500 years on a farm The same chain you are wearing a guan Is another black life in Sierra Leone Boy, they find out mama earth got gold then They mine out mama earth black soul then You work hard just to get a black yard Same card where you swipe by back your black gold then Well on, I see no faces long But this is not a racist song This is a song for the children Who was never told about where the race is from They never hear it in them favorite songs Everybody come and say slavery's done What I got one when the babies come I start read about things like Dow guns, black chemist and kush Black kings, black senate and books We teach about pyramids and put Real significance to with physical looks So every word when we sing black In my world everything black Black, white, white, black, right back So don't be surprised if me send me king black Cause they never told us That black is beautiful They never yeah, the whole told concept, us An idea of black And blackness Has always been demonized From our early indoctrination In the religious training That black is the devil And the, in the movies the, It is popularized that the evil Villain always dressed in black so we have been psychologically programmed to recognize things that are dark as evil. That we think that evil don't occur in the bright light. Do we ever think that evil operates on that night? When that night evil manifests itself and at daylight everything is okay. Most persons are afraid to sleep at night and don't pray. But the same person who sleep at the day and don't pray. How is that? Big daylight, them fall asleep easily. When night comes, they're afraid to sleep without praying because they think in the night is a night will make death comes even closer to you. And so you have to pray now for protection to make you see the light again. What a thing, eh? What a thing. So we don't, people can't do the daytime. People sleep easy at the daytime. People even sleeping at the night and get up and say them prayers and go back to them bed because they never said them prayers before they went to bed. <laughs> Yeah, that's how we have been psychologized, psycholo- psychologically conditioned to fear what is called black darkness. Yet, the same scripture tells you that everything comes out of the darkness. Out of the darkness came forth light. Which means that if you have the Jehovah God as your Almighty God, then that Almighty God dwells in the darkness. Yeah, in the blackness. But again, to all the historians now who give us evidence to searching and reconfiguring information reconnecting the dots and representing the data that gives I and I inspiration J.A. Rogers committed his, his whole life yeah, after going to America born in Negril 1883 goes to America in 1906 by, 19, by 10 years later 1917 Naturalized citizen, live in Chicago, all our kind of various jobs, ultimately get a job on the train line. And it's, always, it's, on, it's in this train line job now that he begin to get some information to help write his first book because in book a, a senator, a white man, upon the train, and him and the white man have some serious reasoning along the journey. Got a white man that show him how white people are superior and how blacks are inferior. And it forced J.A. Rogers to go into some serious information and research for counteract this kind of propaganda. So what he did in 1917, he published what is called a seminal work. And the title is From Superman to Man. I want to them take note of, the, of that book. From Superman to Man by J.A. Rogers. These are things that should be in your house. All black people globally should have a, this particular book and all of Rogers' books in your house. From Superman to Man. 
And in this book now, Rogers have set up a protagonist. And the protagonist is really that racist Southern senator. So it's like a boxing match. And Rogers in one corner, and in the other corner is this racist Southern senator. No different from today. Mitchell O'Connell and these kind of guys from that area. And on the train, they had this very long, 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 long confrontation. And Rogers, of course, had to overpower him with knowledge. So Rogers' books became popular. He also wrote a book called 100 Amazing Facts About the Negro in 1934. He wrote a book called Sex and Race, Volume 1, in 1941. He wrote Sex and Race, Volume 2, in 1942. And he, then he continued to write, and he wrote Sex and Race, Volume 3, in 1944. But the book that I read personally out of his collection that gave me the insight to really free up my own thinking was a book called World's Great Men of Color in 1946 and this was a book that for the first time brought to me the consciousness of great black man and woman personalities before the birth of jesus the christ because in all my own consciousness jesus christ was the greatest man and he was the perfect man and no other man existed before him who was great so me they cannot have it but you see when the history was presented and you got information about the great men and women like Hatshepsut, Aesop, Imhotep. When you begin to see the great black man and woman them before the birth of Jesus, it moves away the f the, that old notion of being inferior. It actually puts you in a position to feel the superiority of the culture that is African. Metamorphosis. J. A. Rogers. Joel Augustus Rogers. That's the name to know. Calling Joel Augustus Rogers. Joel Rogers. By the 1930s and 40s, Rogers was writing history columns in the number of leading black newspapers, including the Pittsburgh Courier, The Messenger, Crisis, Mercury, and the New York Amsterdam News. And let us remember now, you know, let us remember that Joel E. Rogers is 
a his self-trained historian. Self-trained historian. One can't tell about nothing now, go on. It's what you can do with thyself. Joey Lee Rogers. His articles were becoming global. And Rogers was present at the coronation of Emperor Haile Selassie in 1930. So this virgin here wasn't just holding a space. This virgin was moving around. He was gathering information. He was gathering experience. And his commitment was to destroy the myth of white propaganda. White racist propaganda that today has reared its head and today is being sprouted out of the head of the political leadership of the United States in 2019. So the work of a man like Rogers to bring out the knowledge to make black people know themselves seem as if it's all gone in vain, but it's not true. Because we have the powers of recovery and we know we have information and we have the media. We have access to media and we're going to reorganize ourselves and we're going to rethink. We're going to reclaim our writers. So J.A. Rogers is the man. The books, Sex and Race, those are two powerful constructive constructs that I and I need to engage in. Race and sex. Because those forces are, are, are cannot be separated from slavery. And economics. Joey Rogers see that and recognize the importance of I and I to know about race and sex. There are pe people today who want to tell that race don't exist. The world's great men of color. It's something that should also be in everybody's dictionary, should be in everybody's library. Your children should be reading these books rather than reading comics. Or I'm watching some, 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 some weird kind of outer space cartoons. So we could bring ourselves closer to who we really are. Rogers went to His Majesty's coronation. And he also covered the Italian-Ethiopian conflict as a war correspondent for the Pittsburgh Courier. We must, this is a yard man, you know. The yard man at our universities have no real place to put. This man have to go abroad, just like a lot of our great scholars, they have to left Jamaica. And when they achieve their greatness, we don't want to bring them in because they are blackness no, and revolutionary thinkers. Although Rogers had no formal educational degrees or training in any established academic programs, he was widely recognized for his professional excellence and intellect right throughout his career. He belonged to the Paris Society in France for Anthropology. He, began, he belonged to the American Geographical Society and the Academy of Political Science. <laughs> he thinks that this brethren is, a, is an ordinary, ordinary man. In addition, he was also a multilingual. What does that mean? G.E. Rogers, a master German, Italian, French, and Spanish. No, they make they make that sometimes education system make it feel as if we are these one dimensional beings, you know. But we are multi dimensional. We are multiple personalities. No split personality. We have multiple personalities because we are multi talented people. We have to recognize the genesis. We are multi talented because our our genetics. And the memories that we carry give us this predisposition that all we need is an environment to bring out that potential. Rogers wrote anti-racist history using universal humanity as his theme until his death in New York City on March 26, 1966. His wife, Helga Rogers, she continued to republish Rogers' works for some years after his passing. And it's important to note the role of the woman consistently. 
just like Garvey's wife. This is she who actually end up doing the publishing because the man don't have the time to sit down and write. J. A. Rogers, his wife again, who continued to republish his works. So we can separate yourself from female and black woman when black man talk about rising and set up reestablishing ourselves as an empire. It's not a one man thing, I know same sex thing either. Set them possible. Metamorphosis. Remember on, remembering J. A. Rogers, born 1880, passed away in 1966. Self-trained historian, novelist, and journalist. Great, great Jamaican black man writer. And if you run to make it, make it wait and make it, make it wait and make it. Moving into the deconstruction of allegories and mythologies, fables, nursery rhymes, the various devices that they impose on our brain. When you are helpless, 
helpless me, we're not able to, to defend our thinking process. But for those absorb and believe. Yeah, you can't think, you just believe. Well, this is the foundation of Western indoctrination on the brain of black people, the Negroes in particular. Religion has been a very, very important weapon of division and control. There are even some who think that religion is personal. And there are many who will tell that they will not discuss religion. But at the same time, you are, you are socialized into a religion from before you even know your name. What's so personal about that? You are given religious education in school. What's so personal about that? So people who talk about they don't want to discuss religion is because they're afraid of their own lack of knowledge. They're living in a valley of doubt and they don't want to expose themselves because they're holding on to things that they believe but they know it don't go so. They only believe. They don't know. And so rather than expose their weaknesses, them taste it, they don't discuss that. But what is the foundation of this religion? And why is it so personal when we get it in a on a mass basis level we don't get it as individuals we get it within a mass setup and what we really get primarily is a set of stories that we are told that there are morals in these stories and you have to be able to interpret and then you have to be able to apply what you interpret and then it, it gets more and more confusing because we are working in a language that is an alien language so the further you go within the language, the more complicated it becomes and the more confusing it can be. So when things are spoken in the language, that is as a symbol, we have it as a literal event. And when events are literal, we think that it is symbolic. Now when a people give you a book, a book to read, and when you open the book, the first thing says, once upon a time, what would you think about the rest of the rest of that book? Hey, Cassidy, you, you, you get a book for reading and you open the book and the first page you see in Mark, Once Upon a Time. What do you think about the rest of the, about the, rest of the story? Eh? What kind of story? Fairy tale. All right. So Fly Speaks. <laughs> All right. So we said today, if you were to go into the library, um, see a book and take it up and you open it. the first page says once upon a time what would you come conclude the engineer say a more thing says a fairy tale right once upon a time when I'm saying to the item no what is the difference or is there a difference between once upon a time and in the beginning those two phrases are they different or are they identical in meaning once upon a time and in the beginning. When you know, say, may a reason say the two of them mean the same. Once upon a time mean one time upon another time, which means you don't know exactly you don't know exactly when. Same thing goes for in the beginning. You don't know when. So we have been given this great book, which is called the Book of Life. But it has a starting that gives you the concept of a storybook, of a fairy tale in the beginning. So we're moving on from that story, and it takes us into other stories, a series of stories that connect, that's supposed to be history. And from the first story, we hear about a, a garden as a stage where the first society is going to be constructed, and the first set of human behavior it's going to be demonstrated. And right there we see jealousy. We see rot. We see all the deadly sins manifest in that garden. If not in the garden, in the life of the family that has been created. Because at first, so-called human family experiences murder, jealousy, envy, everything. The whole seven deadly sins 
run through that biblical original family. So, the, so the, all of the generations that follow that family suffering from the seven deadly sins. But then Lord God gets so angry. Let me decide to wipe out everything. And here we are now with the concept of a flood. And this flood story now is what I want to zero in a little bit. Because I'm suggesting to the island that it is this flood story that gives black people what I'm calling amnesia. It is the story that washes away thousands of years of black people's history. Makes us unconscious. Wipes away the memory like a tip. You just wipe off the memory and you start again. So we're suffering from lack of self-knowledge. Because of a story that tells us that the world wash away. And in that washing away, only eight people were recovered. Now this story, many people reject it and a lot of people recognize that it's just a, 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 an allegory. But there are too many people, too, too many people who put reality to this story. And the story becomes a serious, you know, handicap in reasoning with even your own black people. Because we are told to accept the idea of a global flood. Yeah? And for 40 days and 40 nights, rainfall. And not only the rainfall for 40 days and 40 nights, there was a specific family now who Lord God decides to spear. Now, this family obviously, from all indications, should have been free of the seven deadly sins and should, be, should have no bad mind. There should be no bad mind in the ship because Lord God was vexed with the world and decided to start it over again. But here we are told about these eight people now locked up in a boat. It's called an ark. And for 40 days and 40 nights, without proper ventilation, all animals of the world, we are told, were collected and locked up in this ark. Now, as a child, that blows the imagination. But you can't question it. When you read about the measurement of the ark, how many cubits by how many cubits, and you realize what a cubit is. It, it, the animals could not fit in that space, but you cannot reject it. You can't reject the story because you're supposed to believe it. But mathematics and architecture and geography, all kinds of things working against the story. So I'm saying to the item now, are we as people today supposed to accept that the black population has a genesis coming out of an ark? What about the condition in the ark? Wouldn't many of those animals die? It sounds like the ark would be a a disease-born ark. Make a stop and check and rethink because black people, we have to make that separation. We have to separate yourself from those biblical stories and reconnect through history. Read J.A. Rogers. Read Cheek Ante Diop. Read Black Writers of Black History. Metamorphosis. Imagine how many dead bodies in that ark. Imagine the smell in that ark. Imagine the disease in that ark and this is what is supposed to restart the world population it dread it must be a european thing I wonder if there were any polar bears on Noah's Ark. Were there any polar bears? And did the dinosaurs exist before or after? Or did they didn't exist at all? Where was Africa during 
this global flood. We were the Chinese people. We were the Indians. Let's wake up. Wake up. People are dead up, enough is enough. The world is in need of change. Free of the innocent ones who they might be not the slammer. Calling all the troops who defend human rights and honor. Tired of poverty, where's our sovereignty? We want it, yeah. This is a bunch of revolution. Revolution. They take away with privacy. All of it, yeah. This social media is more. It's more. Metamorphosis moving into the segment called Afrocentric Views on News, NEWS. 
And of course, news is really data that comes in from the north, the east, the west, and the south. So we have news. And the data is put into a certain formation. And begin and we call that in putting the data in formation. And the, all of those activities are done from a certain perspective. So we have to analyze data and analyze information by considering the perspective of the writer. What is the, what is the objective of the writer? What is the ideology of the writer? And we have to be very critical about all things that we read. We want to find out who write it. Where was the writer? So somebody wrote about a flood, a global flood that washed away the world, kill off all the animals, them, drown out all the people, them, except it. And so you have to ask yourself the question, where was the writer? Where did the writer position him or herself to be able to put down this experience, to be able to write about what happened on the ark? Was the writer in the ark? So we know that this, according to the story, eight people were there. Which one of those eight persons was a writer and what language were they writing in? Who could be able to explain and articulate the, the conversation and the experiments run by this man and the building of the ark and the con two mosquitoes, male and female, and two polar bears, male, all of these things are not a literal event. But we are, we are forced to believe it because it goes against common sense. Now, there's a region called the Middle East. I don't call it the Middle East because the Europeans call it the Middle East. There is no Middle East. Again, it's perspective. From Africa, it's Far East. There is no Middle East. It's a political construction by the Europeans and the Americans. This is a region that controls and has a, a whole host of resource that the earth needs. Now, this reason I want to speak to what's happening in global politics and the importance of resources. I started by saying, have a definition. What is a resource? There are natural resources and there are man-made resources. Natural resources, the land, the, the ocean, the atmosphere, the trees. These are natural resources. And if we use the term resource, I simply to mean what is useful. Then there are things in nature that are useful and there are things in nature that are basic. Now, within humanity, within humankind, we, are, we have found that hu humans spend a lot of time engaged in conflict and in confrontation and in war. And if you check the history of war and confrontation and conflict, nine out of ten times, the struggle is over some type of resource. Now, as an individual, you have to know what is a resource. What is the most important resource in your life? What is the most important resource in an individual person? What's the most important resource in a society? So we're going to work around the concept of resource and resourceful and the importance of having resources. In society, they describe three basic resources for things of function, land, labor, and capital. You have to have land, which is a basic natural resource. You need labor power to work the land. And you need capital. Capital meaning money to invest in equipment, etc., etc. So those were three basic resources to, let us say, develop a society. But then you need raw materials. 
and the resources that you need in terms of raw materials are either in the land or they're in the sea. And wars generally are not fought over seas, even though it has become a modern way to fight over certain territorial waters. But the major confrontation and struggle has been over land and the resources that are in the land. For societies to evolve and develop, one essential requirement is that you have to have energy. You have to have energy to generate, to create movement, to develop your society. And the earth itself provides energy. One of the critical sources of energy is the sun. But it takes some technology and some investment which many countries are unwilling to engage in because if ultimately that will become cheap and therefore there will be no method of controlling the people. So the source of energy that the, the earth has really depended on for the longest time has been coal and has been oil. Now society which is at a stage now where there is a there's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a cry against coal because of its, the, the, the emissions that it let off and the byproducts are not healthy. What is really left as the essence of energy is really oil. And the confrontation we're seeing today in the world that is on the brink of a major war is a struggle over the resource called oil. And the Americans, as far as I'm concerned, started a campaign from the 1970s to secure oil for themselves at, at the expense of any other country. And a very serious thing unfolding in front of us in 2019, which did not begin this year. And as I said earlier, I listened to a program called Face the Nation. And there's a virgin called Pompeo, who is the American War Secretary. And the woman who was interviewing him was suggesting to him that the Americans violated the treaty by withdrawing that had with the Iranians. And the man said, you are starting the clock at the wrong place. He said the clock must start at 1979. Now, what happened in 1979? Why the American government sees this as a starting point of them conflict with the Iranians? So it's not about the Iranians wanting to necessarily make a nuclear bomb. That is not the essence of, the, of America's struggle. America's struggle with Iran started in 1979. I think it started from 1977. I made my exit at the end of 1979 because I man could see something coming on the horizon. We soon get into it. Metamorphosis. Planning a party, club night out, stage show, a gospel concert, or even a business sales event? Let Styles FM be a part of your promoting tool. Take advantage of our low-priced promotion packages with commercials, interviews, giveaways, reviews, and much more. We have special offers when you mix and match and bundle your options. Contact us at 876-286-9216 or 439-5160. Styles FM for the most effective way to exploit your marketing dollar. 
for complete auto repairs and services. Come to Aiken Auto Technology, located at 33 Bumble Crescent, Port Antonio, Jamaica. We offer specialist services in wheel alignment and wheel balancing, brake drum and disc rotary servicing, state-of-the-art ultrasonic cleaning and testing of your fuel injectors. We also stock an assorted range of auto service parts, tires and motorcraft batteries. If we don't have it, we will source it for you. Call us at 876-715-5205 or email aconautotech16 at gmail.com. Acon Auto Technology, beyond the typical auto mechanic shop. It's Wow Factor Tuesdays with Chungi and Shelly. Every Tuesday from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. It's entertainment and interaction at its best. With features like the Share to Care segment, the Uprising 10 Countdown, and the ever-controversial Love Break. Yes, it's the Wow Factor. Your Tuesday mornings will never be the same again. Remember Styles FM on social media. View us on YouTube at Styles FM Radio. Follow us on Instagram at Styles FM. Like us on Twitter at StylesFM961. Become a fan on Facebook, StylesFM96.1. I think I think the rabbit they breed up in the ark. Enough, enough rabbit breed up in the forty days. Can you imagine? Imagine how much rabbit in the, in the ark then after forty days and forty nights. Were there any fights? Any dog fight? Any puss and dog clash? Forty days and forty nights in such a confined space. All the animals in the world. It's a serious imagination that at work, you know. Yeah man, big big imagination. What a smell. Lock up tight, rain or fall for 40 and 40 nights. Maybe just the 40 and 40 nights, 40 dumpling catch a fight. <laughs> so Jesus fasts for 40 days and 40 nights. Something about 40 days and 40 nights. How was up? Yeah, the issue now of resources and war. Right now, 2019, the United Nations is a very, very busy place. The United Nations is being pressured by the world to force governments to respect the need to improve their attitude towards the climate. Because all of the devastation through weather is through the influence of humans human beings who claiming that they have been given dominion over all things. A human right that too, you know. Another human right that. And this dominion now cause everything to suffer. This dominion thing now make females, first of all, become sub, sub, subject now to the, to the human being. The animals become subject to the human being. The plants, and yet without the plants, Human beings can't survive. In a very simple mathematics, you know. The plants that have oxygen and the human beings take it in. And the human beings that have carbon dioxide and the plants take it in. It's such a serious relationship. It's so simple. So simple. But the human being is a destructive being. We're not talking about money, you know. <laughs> talking about a human being. The being that sees itself evolving out of primates. The being who sees his ancestry emerging out of the caves. This is a destructive being. And so the planet is rebelling against humanity. The humankind who has become so unkind. You know, you read the man them book, you know. If you read it carefully, you know, the mythology speaks about two creation stories. One creation story speaks about Man being created through the word. And the other Christian story talk about human beings being created out of the dirt. And if we have to make a choice, be conscious and understand the power of the word. The United States is using 
the propaganda and word sound to convince the world that the attack on the Saudi Arabian oil refinery was a direct hit from Iran. I want to them pay attention to what they're telling us now, you know. The secretary is going around convincing the world that everything came from Iran and Saudi Arabia, which is just a little puppet government, but a source of oil. And so this American government now decide that whether it's a dictator in charge or not, it don't matter. As long as the America will have access to the oil. Now, how did America get into this position? It's not Trump cause it. It's not Trump cause it, you know. Trump come and inherit this. This thing began in 1977. Pompeii say begin in 79. And you see them, them white men, them do have no, them have no, what you call, space for forgiveness, you know. They tell us that we must forgive. They forgive nobody for nothing. These guys were treated for 200 years, see them catch you. But them tell us now that we must forgive and forget. These guys forget nothing and they forgive no one. And it's evident it always is them pursue so-called international criminals. They pursue them to the death. Now, in 1976, America brought to the presidency a man called Jimmy Carter. And Jimmy Carter was a religious man. Jimmy Carter was a peanut farmer. And America just sort of signed off from this conflict, superpower conflict with America versus Russia. They are just beginning to sign some treaties to kind of calm down the Cold War and bring things to a, to a, to a, to a level where they could cooperate better with each other. And when Carter came to the presidency, America was a power along with Russia, considered to be the world's two superpower. But for the first time, America ran up into a little roadblock. Because in 1977, the Arab states decided to unite under the umbrella called OPEC, the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Corporation countries. And OPEC, as a body now, decided to recognize that they have a power. And the power that OPEC had was control of most of the world's oil, this natural resource. So the, these countries now who before were considered to be just some little nobody country. Everything was just Russia and America. But then the man them realized their own potential and organize and unite and it caused a problem in the globe now because the great big bad America, the great superpower, recognized and had to bow to the fact that is oil run them country. And they don't have the oil to run them own country. Them oil is coming out of a region that they call in the Middle East. So in 1977, when the Iranians them rise up under Ayatollah Umini and decide to claim them self-reliance, and reject the puppet government of the Shah. Is that is when America, for the first time, had to bow. They had to bend back ways because they were now over the barrel of oil. And so America was being held ransom, and for the first time, white man buckle. Great superpower America buckle. Buckle at the hands of the Iranians and the rest of the Arab countries who decide to hold the oil. Now, that same set of experiences also affect Jamaica, you know. And it's America alone to feel it, you know. Can Jamaica feel it? And Jamaica feel it to such an extent that our socialist government buckle because the oil price just shoot up and we are on the verge of another 
shoot up in oil prices because we're about to repeat ourselves historically as it relates to America and Iran. But the 1977 events is when Ayatollah Umini showed the world that his oil drive the energy and it's them control it and the Americans swear that they will never ever be get caught out of oil as long as America exists. So from 1979, America has been on a policy to secure all of the oil reserves in the Western world and anywhere they can put their hands on. And so if you recognize the trajectory from 1979, the tra trajectory of America was to go into that region called the Middle East. They entered to Kuwait and ultimately they created that false narrative about weapons of mass destruction. A false narrative. And that false narrative created the pretext and allowed America to enter a sovereign state and to hang the leader of the country. All of that to secure oil. And in 2019, is it any different? Metamorphosis. So you check it out. From 1979 to 2019, 40 years. Yeah, 40 years, 21 and 19. 40 years now, the Americans trying to bring down the Iranian regime. Regime change. So these guys don't give up. Vengeance is theirs. And they tell black people to be meek and to love our enemies more than we love ourselves and when we look at all these all these guys behave it's vengeance they might leave it nothing to the lord the lord is in their hands 
So for 40 years in America, I've been trying to overthrow the Iranian regime. They call it regime change because they don't like hear me? They don't like the leadership. But it's not really that. It's the oil. It's the black gold. The Americans suck and drink oil to keep them country warm. They do everything in the excess. So they have to have this almost endless supply of the black gold. And in 1979, for the first time, America realized that they don't have enough strategic supplies to keep up their lifestyle. They have to tap into the rest of the world. So from the Bush, first father Bush come to power. They start the, the agenda of how to secure themselves for oil for the next 100 years. 40 years gone out of it, you know. Yeah, 40 years gone, and we can see what they're doing. So they went into Kuwait. And ultimately, they got into Iraq. And they were able to secure the oil fields in Iraq. Halliburton and friend them. Yes, as the, as the Americans secured the oil fields in Iraq. It wasn't about no democracy, nothing. It was about the oil. The resource. But the Iranians are still standing. And the Iranians now are being accused of fueling terrorist groups in the region. This region is far from America, you know. But America have a proxy called Israel. Israel is like another American state. Israel is nuclear armed. But it's okay. It's okay because they are Caucasians and they are not Muslims. So they can have nuclear weapons and they can be backed up by the United States government. But Iran must never have these weapons. So the Americans are into this thing called maximum pressure. Squeezing the financial life of the Iranian government because they want them to bow. And the Iranians have their own self-esteem. Their history is more ancient than Americans. America is 200 and a little bit years old. The history of those places go back thousands of years because black people place, you know. Yes, those places place, place belong to black people, Mesopotamia, Euphrates, all these places, black man culture. So we find that the, these Americans, they like to call everybody as liars. They're the first to call you a liar. Yet, the lies that the American government told to get into Iraq is unheard of. Big officials, Secretary of State, going into the United Nations and lying about these weapons that up to today nobody has found. But if trick the world and get the world to think that Saddam is an evil man and Saddam is the worst man and if, if Saddam and Hussein are taken out the whole world will explode. Well, look here now. Watch what's happening today carefully. Because it is Iranian. That is a problem now. And Iran is threatening the world. And Iran is making the world unstable. Is that the United States pushing it? No. no. Because the United States is, is supposed to be the, the salvation. We want to pay attention to what's going on now. You know. And look at the events. Look at the World Trade Center. Look how that building was taken down to wild up American population and to give America an enemy in Bin Laden. Now we see that the oil facility has been attacked. After all of these billions of dollars that the Americans have spent, have, 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 have earned from the Saudi Arabians, selling them all these weapons of defensive capabilities, None of them could have stopped one of the drew on them. So the Houthis are telling the world that they are responsible. Americans say, no, it's not you. It's Iran, do it. So I told Peter, you're a mouth, and next man, I'll tell me, say, not me. It's him, do it. We have to watch the propaganda. Because the Americans are trying to create the pretext that there is a reason for war. And what they want to war over is nothing political, it's the oil. 
It's the oil. And no one to be fooled. There's no democracy business. There's no problem with dictatorship because America has embraced the dictatorship of Saudi Arabia. The women in Saudi Arabia will go into a football match for the first time sometime next week. You think about that. This is one of the most repressive states, but they have the oil money to buy the weapons and the planes and to have Trump administration will sell it to them. So there's no qualms. There's no morality. And you turn the corner and look closer to home now in a place like Venezuela. It's the same issue. It's about the oil. And the Venezuelans are now having the backative of the Chinese and the Russians. And the Americans are saying that the oil is closer to, to their home, so it's their own. So what we have what seen of black people, we have to see the bullyism, we have to see the, the attitude of this racist democracy, and realize that wherever there is the oil, you find that there is a dispute. And you look in Africa, and you look in Nigeria, you see similar situations. Who is financing Boko Haram? But what is in Nigeria? It is the oil. That is the important resource. And that's what the white Americans will do anything to secure. Including invasion, including assassinations. These people have no morality. But we must look to them as some divine source of inspiration and, and, and thing. Watch me on. Black man must wake up in this time. Wake up to the fact that we are not an inferior people and we must move away from that inferiority complex that we are embracing and we must begin to remove that superiority idea that we are projecting on these white people. It is I and I who maintaining within our own brain that these people are superior. And in that context, we keep ourselves in an inferior position. We have to think it all carefully. These wars are about resources. And on the horizon, the new frontier and the next war will be for an even more important resource. Water. Metamorphosis. I wonder what we really do with a captive country. Water is essential and water is life. Captive country. How is that gonna work out? Nature versus the greedy. I make life sweet, so like a jelly. Climb feet it hard, yeah, easy, so forget it. Sang the pan the radio, video pan the telly. Love in my heart, me a spread the catchy medi. B. Melchizedek, Yellow Pakida, and him Empress in Queens. Yeah? Ross Gunamo, long time. No matter where they go, say me, I 
have to live me life. No worries for me yet when me a go a bed at night. Mommy, daddy, sister, you got everybody nice. Cause son and the bird, you need them a fig get a slice. Man, them you so pack a thing and put it on a bike. Send you go a town and then them you cheap on a flight. When you reach a foreign, them a go triple the price. Benz in a community and be malaka. Rice, get them with the ones and so them a fig do it twice. One day underground, the other one a jail for life. A valuable lesson not to happen overnight. Yes, 1977-78, Jamaica was fairly prosperous relative to all, to the exchange rate, etc., etc. Then there was this thing called the OPEC oil crisis. And that oil crisis shocked the globe and shocked the Jamaican economy and sent prices skyrocketing and was the beginning of the end of the manly government. Because that resource, that need, fuel, is essential for any society to function. You have to have energy. Now, with what's happening today, we see that Iranians now are being like, 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 like stick up. Them being stick up. And in that stick up now, the whole flow of oil has become uncertain. The very part are the streets of homos. The, the part along which the tankers must travel. That whole region now is very crowded. International forces are there. The, the French want to be there to observe. The British are want to be there to support the Americans. The Americans are sending troops now to Saudi Arabia. So, this thing are intensifying. And in that intensification, the cost of living going to reach us in a very different way in a place like Jamaica. Because already there is some fidgeting at the pump. And the price of fuel at the pump will rise. And we know the chain effect, chain reaction when the pump price goes up. It means the transportation fees go up. It means everything in the society goes up. That has to be moved. So we can sit here now and pretend as if we, we can anticipate and prepare. We must be observant and see what's happening in the globe. We don't have to wait on CNN or any kind, of, any kind of ABC, BBC thing to tell us what to do. We have our own power of thought and we can analyze. So what would be the replacement in terms of resource for energy? A place like Jamaica, what should we be thinking about? Because we don't grow no oil here. What should be our alternative source of energy? Because you can't function without it. And how much of our resources can we use now to buy this fuel from abroad? So you see, that's why we need thinkers. The university should be generating thinking and these type of answers to our problems. So we have the Almighty Son, which never goes to sleep, yet we don't have any research driven to bring energy from the sun to our society. Like, for example, all, all, all our street lights. Our street lights that are run by solar energy. We are we have sports that have major entertainment and business. Our stadiums. These stadiums should be driven by solar energy. They will capture during the day and use at night if you choose to. We have to begin to think. 
think there is wind power, there is water. And as I speak to water now, I want to realize that the world and the climate conditions is forcing people to realize that in a very short time there's going to be a shortage of drinking water. We don't talk about water generally now. Talk about what they call potable water. There are some countries that are heavily invested in what they call desalination plants. How do you convert seawater to drinking water? It's a very, very expensive ex um, procedure. But look at an island like Jamaica now. J Jamaica is known as a land of wood and water. Now, what about our water resources? Who is managing it? Who is making sure that Jamaica has water for the future? We are about to give away the cockpit country. And the cockpit country, I, from my understanding, is maybe about 40% of our drinking water. Now, what kind of insanity is this? Water is going to be a more important resource than oil in a very short space of time. And on an island like Jamaica, we're not harvesting water. Every parish should have a dam. We should be able to be able to export in water out of the mill bank and all those regions of our island. But you see, we need a little man with a foreign accent to come in and say, Oh yeah, yeah, you know you need to put the yeah, you need to get some dam in that hill to bring to get water, you fools. Metamorphosis. Of Rastri, sail up all the Brooklyn, Bronx, Manhattan, Staten Island, New Jersey, Georgia. Look at the whole America. Hail <laughs> up, see? Hail up, Jojo. Ah, if the program is very enlightening, guess what happened now, Jojo? We don't have no bleaching, yes, you know? We don't have bleach nothing. We don't have lighten up nothing. So there, there are people who are involved in lightening of the skin. We call it skin bleaching. Those who want to lighten up them brain cells, they end up enlightening themselves. I'm on into the blackness, so we program is about in darkening the consciousness. Sure you understand. Yes, I yes, Jojo. And you're up all the security forces. Hail up, Inspector, man called Forbes. Yes, him into the culture too. I've got to pray to Jah to have some mercy. Have some mercy. To keep me safe and guide me to 
travel on my way Temptation is so strong But I must fight you I'll stand up and fight A resource, a resource, anything that is useful. And there are people who are very resourceful. And what do you think is the greatest resource in any society? Because we can speak about natural resources, you know. The sunshine, water, right, land, vital natural resources. These are things that men war over. Man war over land, man war over the resources in the earth. The resources in the earth are many and critical within the earth now are what we call minerals. Now as black people know sometimes because we're not trained to think in certain areas, we're not seeing the importance of even something like a mineral. What is a mineral? These are the, prop- the ingredients that help to make up the things that we need in society. Technological equipment. Everything that we build and so forth, we need minerals. But the minerals are in the earth. And then the African black man now, through Christianity and religious indoctrination, has been led to believe that there's nothing under the earth of value. What's under the earth is actually dangerous because under the earth is hell. Now, early indoctrination, you know, before we start learning about metals, and important things for society. By the time we're three years old, we're afraid of underground. And all we know is that underground is about six foot six. So we, our brain can't go further than six foot six when we're thinking about underground. But the white man goes thousands of hundreds of meters underground to find the minerals. The minerals that make the things them that we need in society. So rather than be afraid of underground, we should be actually gathering the material that's underground, the diamonds, the coltron, and you look into the Congo, and you look into Nigeria, where the greatest conflicts are being fought right now. Those are the lands that have the greatest amount of resources. Is my virgin said to me, Antonio, the historian, he said, wherever there is, Great amount of resource. There is also the conflict. And he pointed out Nigeria. And he pointed out the Congo. So the resources. We have to begin to think about resources. Those who are thinking about going to heaven are not interested in resources. Because to them, the earth is just a temporary place. And they just pass through. Where we are all passing through, but because the generations are coming, we are always here. So we have to deal with the resources that are right here. So the land, and under the land, there is no hell down there. Hell is when we have no access to resources. Then we face hell. So the minerals are in the earth. They have to be mined. There is water. There is oil. And out of the two between water and oil, we can exist without oil. We can't exist without water. So a place like Jamaica, we should be a, a, a water reserve. I mean, we should be, we should also have water in abundance here that can be used, not just running aimless in the streets. So there need to be structures. There should be a dam in every parish, for example. But they say those who govern, they're not interested in those areas. They're interested in securing power that they can enjoy the resources of the land. And when they enjoy the resources, they tell the population now that the resources are scarce. So people enter this political tribal world now with a false concept of scarce resources. When there is abundance, there is abundance. What is problematic is the distribution. Let us look at land, for example. Who controls the land in Jamaica? Who controls the land? The church, the planter class, the government. But the massive population, black population, is landless. 
today, the, most of our people are called squatters. So the resource is not being distributed to who needs it. It's being controlled by a few. And wherever there is a tightening in resources, there's going to be angry people. There's going to be war. There's going to be conflict. There's going to be tension. And so the world right now is focused on this war for oil. But down the road, and not so far down the road, there's going to be a war for water. And Jamaica people better realize that's a very serious commodity. You see what happened with Hurricane Dorian passed through. And in Hurricane Dorian done with Bermuda, people them needed water. Jamaica should be in a position. Portland should be in a position to be a leader in the export of water. Neither political party has ever moved in that direction. They talk about tourism. We see we are a major company that carry tourists around the world. Crash today. And one big scrambling to get these people back home. This tourism is not a sustainable and, and a, a, should, should not be a permanent part of our economic framework. Because when the tourist is injured, our economy becomes also injured. We need to ground our economy in some more basic resources like the land and the water. We could develop some water supplies. We could reopen the dams. We could get some international loans and invest in water. It is the future as much as it is the present. Metamorphosis. Pressures of your life and it tough. No stay down, mama. Time pick it up. No bother with the down full style. Strictly up full vibes. I pick it up when the bills, them, the rent and the mortgage due. Yeah. yeah. When me chalice, when your best friends are gone and it's only you. Yeah. Like a past lift on up the music. Everybody wanna. There's a harmony that brings everything together. So I'm sing together. And who said life no order? And every man got this struggle. I beg you to help me, Lord. And let me know what my struggle can be sweet. Yeah. Everybody wanna feel like free. Forget your troubles and you rock with me. You know, feel a reggae. So metamorphosis into the final 15 minutes looking at resources and so we look into the individual now and the society and the question is rhetorical of course but what do you think is the most important resource in a society most important resource is it natural or is it physical is it man-made man-made resources you know things like a bridge buildings machinery those are resources made by man and they were resources that are natural now, out of all of the resources, which one of the resources you think is the most important resource for our society? Well, I'm going to tell you, Adam, that the most important resource 
in any society is the people yeah the people are the most important resource in a society of course the society has been grounded in some space and time so they will be on some land and so we have to also define whether the land has resources within it because there are some lands that are really barren and there's some lands that have great amount of resources within but the most important resource within the society is the people so if we want to talk about developing our society now we can't be investing in developing the natural resources we can't be investing all our money in in, in bauxite and in mining and these other other areas yes those are resources those are natural resources but the most critical resource is not the bauxite but the people and so when, this, when, the, when those who are leading put to lead and those who, who are put to lead you know are not leaders you know they are servants those who we put to lead are not our leaders they are our servants it's the people who are the leaders and the people must lead by selecting good servants so the thing around back is and we, we need to reverse that curse but returning to the concept of resource and talent if we recognize that the most important resource in a society is the people then each individual can ask themselves what is the most important resource in a them what is your most important resource and so you have to check yourself yeah what is how how resourceful are you and so there's a very basic way to, to, to check yourself you know one thing is to recognize that every individual every individual is born with some talents that's the premise that we have to work with we don't know what the talents are but we're saying every individual is born with talents and we arrive at that because of the power of genetics that the generations that that bring you through along with the egg and the sperm come talents and dispositions that are genetically within so they become dispositions they become potentials so everybody is born with talent everybody is born with potential no what is also required now to activate the, the powers within is your attitude because you can become a resourceful person if you begin to put all these forces together so attitude now and at, for an example of your attitude for example you see a glass that has water in it halfway what is your attitude or your view towards that glass so so Cass, a glass of water and it is half it has half of it is filled is it half filled or is it half empty so that is a question being put to help you identify your attitude there's a glass in front of you and there's some water in it and the water is halfway in the glass is the glass half filled or is the glass half empty so you see your response to that now we have to define your attitude towards a lot of other things are you positive and, and optimistic are you negative or pessimistic is the glass half filled or is the glass half empty how you view it that can help you define your attitude to how you're going to move towards certain things so the greatest resource within the individual now is the brain power is your brain power your talent your attitude will help to define how you develop the resources that are within so develop your own resource develop your thinking power 
do it if you're Brian Paul. So, if we were to begin to exercise more consciousness around the resources that we have, we will be able to build, not just our individuals, but build our communities, build our families, build our nation, rebuild the race. So, the concept of, of resource, there are resources around us, natural, man-made. But if we begin to put resources together, and within society now, we create when we put labor and capital and talent, we begin to put these forces together to generate. So, long and short of it, you are who are very resourceful in their thinking. They are given situations that appear to be unsolvable, but because they are resourceful, they are able to tap into their intelligence, tap into certain memories, and they come up with certain amount of answers. So in other words, now, what say, check yourself. We are not blank. We are talented. We have potentials. What we need to develop is a proper attitude to activate those potentials. Metamorphosis. of man brings to the consciousness the resource in this island that has been up to today it is now becoming a, f- a frontline resource that's being transformed into cash and money because to get around and get things done in the society you now the resource that is most useful now is money yeah you have to have the cash and the cash is generated now by being able to gener- create goods or services that others will spend their cash on. Now, the education system again, and the religious education that we get from even before we get to the public school, 
doesn't put great emphasis on how to secure this particular resource. We actually told that if we get too much of it, we become evil. And that is easy for a camel to go through the eye of a eagle and for a man with a whole of cash get into heaven. And so we have this anti-cash vibrations, yet we can go through society without that particular resource. So we're not conflicting thoughts. Some people say they love it, and some people say it's not something to love. But I don't think people really love money. What people love is what money can provide. They love the end result of what money does. And what money really does brings, give you access to basic needs. And to another extent, it can bring you the wants that you speak of. But the resource in this island here that could be part of the salvation of our economic downtrod is a ganja. It's a natural resource. So natural resources now mean like water and like the sunlight. This resource has the potential to transform not just Jamaica but African, Caribbean and Pacific states right across the globe. And this resource is what is being manipulated and controlled by European and American forces because they want to have total domination and control over this particular resource. Now, Rast- North Rastaman go to jail and get family disconnected and abused and really, really ab- brutalized because this particular resource is not just resourceful in terms of generating cash. It is a medication it's a medicine and the medicine is not just pharmaceutical the medicine is also psychological and spiritual so we have to recognize when we have resources and when the world demands the resources that we have that we should close ranks and make it into a commodities that are marketable that I and I can benefit in terms of you know, having access to cash. But what we find is that this particular resource has been hijacked by the forces that have money and the whole idea now of making cash from this resource is being marshaled by a few. But I'm saying, you know, let us not get caught up in that. We realize that this resource is broader than medicine, that this resource can generate 2,500 different products once we speak about industrialization of hemp. This is what nature has given us, a natural resource from which we can generate 2,500 different products. And it is from goods and services that you make money. So we have a straight line to cash if we move along the line of industrialization. In the 1960s, Jamaica invited foreign companies to get involved in industrialization of bauxite because bauxite then was considered to be the prime natural resource. And so they had a thing called industrialization by invitation. And companies were brought into the country to do what they did. We'll see what the result is with the bauxite mining and we'll see the negative side effects of bauxite mining. But here we have something new on the horizon. We have the potential for hemp to be industrialized. And that's where we're supposed to be pushing. We're pushing for the industrialization of hemp, a natural resource that is not psychoactive but can produce goods to allow I and I to able to generate cash. This is a resource that we have given to us by nature, just like the sunshine, just like the breeze. We could develop our natural resource into our wealth. Metamorphosis. <laughs>